Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Music Den. I'm your host, Armando Venditti, and I hope you guys are having a fantastic evening. As I'm recording this a bit late, uh, I did this a bit late because I got a late start today. But I wanted to do this uh, video because I basically got a bit of a burst of energy to do this. So in this installment of The Music Den, I'm going to be doing another episode of albums that have turned 50, that have turned 50, sorry, in 2023, okay? Now, this group that I'm going to be talking about, um, some people give them the title of um, Godfathers or Creators of Heavy Metal. And I have seen in interviews where they've said, especially the guitarist, has said that they've never seen themselves as a heavy metal act. They've just seen themselves as a hard rock act with blues leanings. The band is Black Sabbath. And the album I'm going to be talking about is Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath. Now, Sabbath. Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath, it is like guys, I'm sorry, uh, was released in November of 73. It was recorded from September to November of 73, released on Warner Brothers Records, produced by the band, and um, it was um, a platinum album in the U.S., a gold album in Canada, and um, and it reached number 11 in the U.S. charts, number 17 in Canada, and number 4 in the U.K. It, this album, uh, being the band's fifth album, um, they were coming off the tour of Volume 4. And they were basically under pressure from Warner Brothers to come up with a follow-up, seeing how Volume 4 was so... Uh, popular. So they basically found themselves in LA, started uh, to try to write music in LA, but due to self-admitted uh, substance abuse and other distractions, mostly substance abuse, they really didn't get anywhere with uh, writing material. They went back to England and uh, recorded the album at Morgan Studios. And they were rehearsed the album, uh, material for the album in uh, Clearwell Castle, which is in the Forest of Dean, which to some people um, is, uh, they, some people have claimed that it, it is a haunted castle. Um, whether it was or not, who knows? I tend to go for these kinds of stories myself, but um, it, it was said that the castle was haunted. There was a story of Ozzy Osbourne and Tony Iommi uh, walking down one of the corridors, and at the end of the corridor, they saw this uh, silhouette in black just basically walking ahead of them, and they tried to catch up to the silhouette or the figure, and they could never catch up to them. Uh, a lot of the material or a good amount of the material was uh, rehearsed in the dungeon of the castle. So to, uh, according to Gizu Butler, it gave the album a bit more of an eerie feeling uh, in terms of their songwriting ideas. Uh, Tony Iommi had said that he did feel pressure to deliver, uh, to come up with the guitar riffs for said songs that they were trying to work on. Um, but, you know, he he was having writer's block. Again, whether that was attributed to substance abuse, who knows? I mean, that was a time where drugs were rampant, you know, everywhere. And they partook along with a number of other acts. Okay, um, <clears throat> this album for me, I discovered it in 1996. 
and um I, it was an interesting album to listen to i originally thought that the music was really good the compositions were complex were hard driving intricate um and that Ozzy's vocals basically were not anything spectacular, but I've since come to re <laughs> do a reappraisal of it, and I found that Ozzy's uh, vocals on this are quite good. Um, t Tony Iommi has said also in interviews that, and this is not a knock against Ozzy. He said he said, but. Ozzy would couldn't really come up with his own melody lines to go on top of what of the music. He basically just sang what the guitar line was for the melody. Um, that um, again, sorry, he wasn't knocking Ozzy Osbourne about this, but that he felt that um, Ronnie James Dio, when they were rehearsing, little sidebar, when they were rehearsing or listening to uh, demos for uh, Heaven and Hell, that Ronnie James Dio had an ability to take the music and come up with his own melody lines on top of what, what was already written. That was almost like a counter, um, almost like a, a counterpoint to the melody that was already there. But, um, I mean, the album is very good. It's very... Uh, technically proficient the 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 riffs on here are blistering um you know um what i like about this album upon listening to it again is it's it's more it's somewhat diverse it is more diverse they were going for different um soundscapes like textures in terms of using mellotron um keyboards, symphonies um, on this album, which, I mean, they really, you know, I, they started to do this uh, slowly, I uh, believe with uh, Master of Reality and Volume 4. They just continued it on this album uh, with Sabbath, uh, Bloody Sabbath. Uh, songs of note on the album are um, the title track, which is fantastic. Uh, the instrumental fluff, which is a beautiful acoustic instrumental, uh, about four minutes long, and it's it's just it it's the outrider out um of the album. Like it 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 stands out over anything else that's on there. It's great, you know. It's fantastic. Um, <clears throat> Sabra, Dabra. Uh, uh, it's another fantastic track. I believe uh, it ends up side one, and it features uh, Rick Wakeman from Yes uh, on um, keyboards and piano. And uh, Yes, at the time, we're recording Tales of Topographic Oceans, right? So I believe that they were in the next studio, and they, you know, they borrowed Rick Wakeman for that. Um, and uh, one of the other tracks that really stand out for me is uh, Spiral Architect, which is uh, the, the last track on the album. And th this again, um, track, sorry, this track again, features use of Mellotron, of keyboards, uh, synthesizers, uh, also um, symphonic elements are used on it. Um, also, um, it it features I'm sorry it features at the end almost like a it's like where it's almost like they're performing it in a concert setting and you hear the audience react at the end of the song like cheer and clap and 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 engage with the band at the end of the song. What I like about this this album overall though is it it kind of breaks out of the mold of what you expect from. Black Sabbath at the time. And it's obvious that they were trying to explore new ground using different instruments, uh, different techniques. And it's also got to be said, uh, Bill Ward on, on drums, he holds down the fort, man. On like he, he 
underpins everything down to perfection. Um, you know, and he also has a bit of a, not, not a bit of a, quite a bit of a, quite a swing element in his drumming style. So that also adds another dimension to the music. You know, so um, I think, I mean, at this time in the 70s, bands were releasing one or two albums a year, uh, trying to keep up with demand from the record companies, because depending on the record contract you signed, as I said in the Bowie video, you were contracted to do an al one to two albums a year and release a single uh, once every 30 days to promote whatever album it came from. So these bands like Sabbath and, and Bowie and et cetera, were under tremendous, tremendous uh, pressure to deliver a product to the company, right? To the record companies. And really the record companies didn't care how you delivered it to them. As long as you delivered a product that they could promote and make money off of, right? So, and for me, Sabbath delivered on this, on this album. So, but um, again, that is my opinion. So, please down below, down there, please let me know your opinions on Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath. Do you like Sabbath? Do you not like Sabbath? Do you like the album? Do you think that? No, well, I should also let me go back a bit. Um, before I sign off, I forgot this part too, uh, that Ozzy, in retrospect, felt that um, this was when he should have left the band um, because he felt that he was too stoned, too, too drug dependent in order to be able to continue. And he surprised, sorry, he was surprised that they were able to get the album uh, finished and out because I mean, he basically has said that he was out of his mind on drugs at this point, as he said, they all were, but him in particular. So I, I, I would have been remiss if I didn't mention that part. Um, but again, leave your comments down below. If you like Sabbath, if you like this album, if you don't, um, I like I've said I've gained a new appreciation for it, and I will be giving it a lot more spins as um, as time goes on. So that's it for now. Hopefully you guys are having a great night again. Please uh, click like and subscribe, and click the notification bell to keep yourselves on top of any new content that I've got coming up. Um, I was just emailing uh, Bill Sh um, Bill Schuster. And um, about doing uh, the uh, Pink Floyd album ranking, and we're gonna I'm gonna be doing that with Bill and uh, Ryan Gavalier. You know, we have to just align our schedules and see how it's gonna work. And uh, Bill and I are gonna do um, a Chilliwack album ranking soon, and uh, there's more stuff coming up. So please, uh, please stay tuned, and hopefully you guys are liking what I'm doing. And I'm noticing the uh, the uh, subscriptions are going up, so I thank you for that. I thank you for all your support that I've that I've uh, with everything I've done so far, and hope you like what I'm doing. And uh, and let me know, please. So that's it for now. Uh, you guys take care of yourselves and one another, and we will chat very soon. Bye for now.